Mark chapter 16. Man, I got a lot to share with you here. This is going to be some information. There's going to be things that you know. There's going to be things that maybe you never thought of before. Amen? Amen. I'm going to be touching on divine healing, and then I'm going to go into talking about the deliverance ministry and how important it is. We're going to focus in on this thing. Anybody? Now, did anybody have any spiritual warfare go on today? <laughs> anybody have a problem getting here tonight? Oh, come on, somebody. My goodness. You know, when that happens, you know something's going on. Something's, something's good going to happen, right? When the devil's trying to stop you to go to a meeting, that's the meeting you want to be at. If, in fact, if you're going to a meeting and there is no resistance, dad, just stay home. <laughs> the devil's not threatened, right? <laughs> All right, Mark chapter 16. Let's take a look at um, verses 14 through 20 here. And it says, later he, Jesus, appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. And he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. Whew, unbelief and hardness of heart. That's, that's, not, that's not good, amen? Because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel or good news to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. Man, that's the first thing he said there. But look, it's so avoided in the body of Christ. It's a taboo subject, isn't it? They will speak with new tongues. Oh, there's another one. Right? Whoa. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly... It will, not, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. God's either telling the truth or he's lying. Right? So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. I like that. The Lord working with them. And confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Man, I like that. That just strikes a chord every time I read it. So they were obviously preaching what Jesus was talking about. And when they preach it, the Holy Ghost said, that's something I want to get involved in. And things start to happen. Now go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Oh, you're in a place of faith tonight, people. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. For with God, all things are possible. I don't care what you're going through, what, you're, what you've been dealing with. God can turn it around like that. Amen. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Here's a passage that many people just kind of look over. But man, this is rich. Simon Peter, the bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Underline it. Grace and peace be added unto you. Oh, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. For grace and peace to be multiplied, you need to know some things from the Word of God. You following me? And a, a knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and and godliness. There's not one thing that this word doesn't cover to cover you and I in this life. Oh, man. Given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. There's that knowledge thing again. You know, I kind of recall God said somewhere that my people perish due to a lack of knowledge. Who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be, here it is. This is the mind blower. If you're just picking this up with your natural mind, you're going to miss it. You need to pick this up with your spirit right now. That through these precious promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I'm convinced that we as Christians have been living down here when God says, I created you to live up here. Are you following me? 
We cannot just roll over when the devil comes and attacks us in life. We cannot roll over when sickness or disease or, or something comes into our life that's not the will of God. We can't roll over. And that's why I said, you need to get mad at the real enemy. Many people, come on, many people are blaming God. God, why'd you do this? Why'd you do this? God saying, I had no part of it. Amen. But what I did do is I put promises in my word that will pull you out of that pit. Amen? Amen. Now, most Christians think the word salvation simply means that when they die, that they're going to be in heaven for eternity. And hey, of course, it includes that and praise God for that. Amen? That is true. But that is, uh, that's just one part of salvation. Salvation goes much deeper. Here you go. The word salvation has been called the all-inclusive word. The Greek word that's translated saved in salvation implies, get this, the blessings of healing, preservation, health, soundness of mind, deliverance, spiritual, and physical healing. That's all wrapped up in that one word. Isn't that powerful? Romans 10, 15 says that the gospel is tidings of good things. More than one thing is available to Christians through the gospel. It says good things. You know, if our God healed under the old covenant, we are under a new and better covenant. If, I, honestly, I would stand before him and say, God, if you did away with healing, come on, somebody. How? How could that be better? Why, why would you leave us down here with, with, you'll notice in a minute that there's a lot of avenues for healing. But I would, I would, I would ask him, God, why? right? How can that be better? Well, the fact is, it is new, and it is better, and it includes healing. It includes deliverance. Now, let me touch on a few things here. Now, in a healing service, there's so many avenues I can go down, but you probably don't want to be here till three in the morning talking about this, do you? Right? Okay, some might want to. I get it. But, but each healing service we do, I'm going to touch on a, a different thing each time. So it's, it's going to be like a puzzle, being pieced together, Okay? So just know, I can't touch on everything in one service. So, uh, But here's the deal. Sin was the doorway where sickness, disease, and bondage entered this world. Through Adam's disobedience, God told Adam, don't eat of that fruit. God, uh, Adam was responsible for Eve. Are you following me? God told Adam, don't eat of that fruit. The moment he ate of that fruit, the curse came into this earth. That's when everything got flipped upside down. Come on. It was never in the original plan of God. Because God, listen, God is not the author of sin. Are you following me? Neither is he the author of the fruit of sin or the fruit of the curse that entered in. So to, let's put it this way. To say that the fruit of sin is the will of God, you would be saying, if you want to stay congruent on that thought process, you would have to say that sin is the will of God. Is there anybody in here that would say that sin is the will of God? But we say it all the time. Oh, God's trying to teach me a lesson. God's doing this. God's doing that. You following me? We say things that contra contradict. It's not even a, a straight thought process. It's just kind of this dead religious junk that we need to scrape off. Amen? Amen? A person who tells me that sickness and disease is God's will for them, I ask them this question, and it shuts them up real quick. I say, have you ever gone to the doctor? And of course, they'll say, oh, of course I have. And then I'll say, why are you fighting against the will of God then? <laughs> shuts them up real quick. See, it doesn't even make sense. This dead religious junk has to go. It's got to get out of here. Amen? Amen. 1 John 3, 8. It says, For this purpose, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Everything Jesus did in his earthly ministry, he destroyed the works of the devil. Go ahead, read it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read it through in the Gospels. Everything he did, he destroyed the works of the devil. I love that. I love how... The word of God says this. Jesus said one time he was healing a man and, and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you, right? And these, these Pharisees and all these religious people were getting upset. 
And Jesus said, your sins be forgiven you. So they were all upset. And he said, um, he said, you know, what's easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk. You know what Jesus was saying there? It's the same package. It's salvation. Are you following me? Come on, we need some light bulbs to go on tonight. Amen? Acts 10.38, go there with me. Acts 10.38. We're preaching some good news tonight. Amen? I'm here to tell you there is good news. All right, Acts 10.38. I love it. It says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing some. Oh, what, what? Oh, he healed all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. I love that. Everywhere he went, man, he was releasing freedom. He was releasing healing. Go with me real quick to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Well, you know, maybe God doesn't want me healed, right? I mean, you hear people talk about that all the time, right? Well, if that's the case, why would God even put this provision in there? Look at this. James 5, 14 through 16. Is anyone sick among you? Let him or her call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith. Say prayer of faith. faith. Will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. And then don't stop there. Most people stop right there. Keep going. Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. You know what this is inferring? Some things that people have gone through, they got such a heavy load emotionally, they're not willing to confess or to talk to someone about it, so they keep the load in their own heart, and it affects their physical body. And this is even saying it will hinder your healing. Are you following? I bet you never even looked at that before like that. Is any sick? Now, notice this. It does say that if any sick, let them call. Let him call for the elders of the church. You know, sometimes we just don't follow the instructions in the book, do we? Well, I'm ticked off. Where's pastor at? I don't know. Give me a call. Let me know what's going on, right? Let me know what's up. Give me an invitation. Uh, and not just for me. I'm, I'm not, our people are great here. I'm not, uh, what I'm saying is just in general, following the instructions in the book. Amen? So God has made many provisions. Amen? Now, here's the deal. Here's what I want you to see. A prayer for healing in this passage is referred to as a prayer of faith. Now, you got to know something about faith. Faith begins where the will of God is known. If you don't know the will of God on a situation, it's impossible to have faith. You following me? You cannot have faith for something that you don't know belongs to you. You just can't. You need knowledge of it to have faith. So it's merely a hope, right? In fact, it's probably a worldly hope. Oh, I, hope I, I hope I get healed. I hope I get delivered, right? But that's not the prayer that, that heals people. It's the prayer of faith. And here's the thing. You can only pray the prayer of faith for something that God has promised his people in the word of God. Now, here's where I'm going with it. God refers to the prayer for healing as a prayer of faith. Evidently, God believes that he put enough evidence in his word that you and I can pray in faith and believe God for healing. Did you follow that? God called it a prayer of faith, but you can only have faith for something that you, that you know belongs to you through the word of God. So he believes there's enough evidence. Do we? Oh, my, my, my. See, our heavenly father has provided so many avenues for healing in the word of God. And, and as we do these services, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the av- avenues in detail. But even this, do you ever think about this? Even the function of the human body and how it was created proves that the will of God is to heal. It, when sickness and disease touch your body, immediately your immune system goes to work. God created it that way. See? 
He created, even nature itself, even the way we're creative, po created points to healing. God wants you well. In fact, you know, the, the real will of God is that we are whole. We're whole and healthy. That's the will of God. He, but he made provision for healing. Are you following me? See, here's the deal now. God is not against doctors, all right? So don't run out of here and say, well, you know, James is not, uh, you know, for doctors. No, 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 no. He's not. In fact, Luke was a physician. You do know that? The book of Luke? Luke was a physician. God's not against doctors, but he is against you making an idol out of the doctors. He, he is against you putting all your hope and faith in a person who can't do anything for you. All a doctor is doing is, there's a reason they call it practicing medicine. You figured that out? Yeah, they're practicing medicine. Mm. Well, I, 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 once I read in this, this Christian book about how, you know, when we eat healthy and do what we need to do, we're, we're helping that God-given ability to heal us within, that God gave us. See, that's all the doctors are doing. They're just doing something to try to Help that healer within. Are you following me? Unfortunately, a lot of medications and stuff, uh, a lot of these things, you know, um, have terrible side effects. I mean, some, you, you got to take them to, don't, now, in the, after this service you get prayed for, do not stop taking your medicine. Do not stop taking your medicine. You keep, it, keep at it until the doctor tells you you don't need it anymore. Hello? Amen? All right, we got to put that little disclaimer in there. Go to Acts chapter 3. Go to Acts chapter 3. Oh, wait, wait till I touch on this whole deliverance thing. Oh, you're going to love it. All right. Well, I'm just kind of giving a little bit of a foundation for the physical healing aspect of it right now. All right. This is about a lame man that was healed. And, you know, all right, I'm going to go. Now, Peter and John... I was going to cut it short, but no. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. <laughs> and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. I want you to notice those feet and ankle bones didn't receive strength until he moved. You got to put action to your faith. You got to put action to your faith. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it, was, that it was he who sat begging at alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what, have, what has happened. Here we go. Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, Solomon's greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, listen to this, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us? As though, here we go, you got to get this. As though by our own power or godliness, we made this man walk. See, we have nothing to do with it. It's the Holy Ghost operating through us. Maybe that's why a lot of healings and stuff don't happen, because you're relying on yourself more than the Holy Ghost. What if we just had a simple faith in the Holy Ghost and in the name of Jesus? What if? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead, of which you are witnesses. And here it is, and his name, there it is, underline it, through faith in his name. 
It's all about Jesus. It's all about, man, when you start talking about Jesus, that's when the Holy Ghost said, now I'm ready to rock and roll. You start talking about the, the, the name of Jesus, you start speaking the word into your situation and into your life, that will activate the Holy Spirit. The, in fact, that looses the angels of God on your behalf. Whom God has raised from the dead, and his name, and through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect, here it is, soundness. You could put the word salvation in there, and you're doing no injustice. Soundness in the presence of you all. I love that. So through faith in his name, through faith in the name of Jesus. So obviously, the disciples and the apostles preached healing as a benefit of the new covenant. Man, I say this all the time on my Sunday morning services. I say, if you want to look at the, the topics that the devil fights so hard, if you want to know what the most powerful topics are in the Christian faith, Look at the ones that the devil fights so hard against. Amen. Healing, deliverance, casting out demons. Come on, praying in tongues, yes. the gifts of the Spirit. All these things that divide denominations. Yes. Are you following me? Yes. You want to look at the most powerful things? If you want to walk in power in your Christian walk, a lot of these things that the devil's fighting hard against, you better get in the Word and get um, seek the Lord with all your heart for his power to flow through you. Amen. And he will. My goodness. See, I, a lot of people say, a lot of people say, well, you got to stay in the middle of the road on all these topics. Well, here's the thing. When you're so far in the ditch on the other side, if your car is about ready to go in the ditch, you got to overcorrect to get back to the center. We need to do some overcorrecting about these things that are, that are neglected in the body of Christ. Amen. Jesus said he came to do the will of his Father. If sickness and disease and bondage were the will of God, Jesus would be fighting against the will of his Father. Are you following me? I mean, these are just kind of common sense, you know, things. That, but, but we don't think of them. We don't think of them. So when it comes, here's the, here's the thing with divine healing. When it comes to the topic of divine healing, most people, the majority are tripped up by personal experiences in their life where maybe they lost a loved one, they lost a family member. And so many times these, you know, you hear all the time, well, grandma, you know, she got cancer and she was a great Christian, right? She loved the Lord and God didn't heal her, right? Come on, I'm getting down to the rubber of things right now. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is why many people throw away the topic of healing because they've been affected by the passing of a loved one. I remember, so my mom passed away at 54 years old, all right? She passed away. She had a heart attack in her sleep. I mean, you know, I mean, that rocked, the, that rocked us. That rocked us. 13 years later, I'm still like, man, woo, that was a gut shot. Are you hearing me? But I remember this. I remember at her funeral, and, and I said, I said, God, number one, I am not blaming you for this. And I said, number two, I will continue to preach the word of God on healing. Amen. See, the devil's trying to say, oh, well, even your own mom died. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, devil. No, no, no. Sorry, it's too late, devil. I know too much evidence from the word. I know too much evidence to keep my mouth shut. Oh, no, we're going to blast it from the rooftops. Amen? So, so there's so many factors in a situation when a loved one dies. And, and here's where you got to come to peace with about this. God knows the secret things of all these things. In fact, one day you're going to get up into heaven and God's, you're going to ask God the question, why did such and such, what happened? And he's going to give you an answer and he, you're going to say, oh, okay, all right. Wow, I wish I would have known that on earth. But yeah, that's okay. I get it now. My point is this, don't hold bitterness toward God. He had nothing to do with it. There, there's situations that happen in life. There's, there's bad things that happen, all right? But listen to me. That's why we cannot base our faith on our experiences. No, no, no. We base it on the word of God. Amen? So I just want to encourage you. Just, 
Just, I'm asking you just to reset. Push reset on your brain tonight. Just anything, any of the negative things you ever thought about with this topic, just push reset. And have an open heart to receive the word of God and what it says. Amen? Amen. Tradition, the word of God says, tradition of man can make the word of God a no effect in your life. In other words... The results that the word of God are intended to bring into your life can be short-circuited because of your unscriptural beliefs. You following me? So this is some serious stuff. So here we go. Are you ready to kind of shift gears here? I gave you just a little, little, you know, foundation on divine healing, but we're shifting gears. Get ready. Put your spiritual seatbelts on. We're going to talk about deliverance from demons. Amen? Amen. I know that's why many of you are here. You know, some people, when they see just healing service, you know, they kind of like, eh, well. But when you see deliverance, you're like, I'm all in, baby. I'm all in, absolutely. Don't you want to know? Is this, is this deliverance thing really of God? Is this really true, right? Oh, my, we've been lied to in the body of Christ. Many have believed a lie in the body of Christ. I'm here to say it right now. And for the most part, many have believed it. The enemy has done a great job for people to grab onto this. And this is the lie, that a Christian cannot be affected by demons. Are you following me? That a Christian cannot have a demonic issue in their life and need deliverance. This lie has made, here's the problem with it. This lie has made many Christians remain in bondage, in confusion and frustration, and I'm sorry to say it, but some have even committed suicide because they were in such bondage and they thought there was no hope. All because they never heard a message like I'm about to give you right now. Jesus said in Luke 4, 18, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Most people who say, that the deliverance ministry is not for the Christian. Can I, can, I, can I let you in on a little secret here about these people? They've never cast one demon out. They've never been involved in deliverance ministry in their whole life. Why do people believe them? Are you following me? So I'm telling you right now, I've been involved in deliverance ministry for 23 years. So I'm passing on some of these things that I've learned in the 23 years. But Christians that work in this kind of ministry, the deliverance ministry, realize very quickly this truth, that the deliverance ministry is primarily for Christians. The deliver oh, let me say that again. The deliverance ministry. Now, when I'm talking about deliverance ministry, I'm talking about casting demons out. Right? The deliverance ministry is primarily for Christians. People always push, try to push a de demon problem off to un an unbeliever. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Here we go. Well, I feel like we got some fresh wind flowing in here now. All of a sudden, some people I see are about ready to go to sleep. They're all eyes now, baby. They're ready for this. They want to know what's up. Is this for real? Is this for real? Is this something I've been missing my whole Christian life? Yes. Matthew 12, 43 through 45, I want to look at here. Remember, push reset on that brain right now. I don't care what you believed or thought. Follow the evidence that I'm going to give you in the word of God. Here it goes. Jesus said this. When an unclean spirit or a demon goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they, all of them, enter, uh, they enter and dwell there. And here it is, the last state of that man 
is worse than the first. So shall it be in this wicked generation. Here we go. Casting demons out of an unbeliever will make them worse than what they were in the beginning. Because only a Christian has the ability to keep demons from coming back. Are you following me? I'm here to tell you the deliverance ministry is primarily for the Christian. Those that are in covenant through Jesus Christ. It's nothing more than a, a deception, a lie from the devil to keep Christians in bondage, to keep them blinded from the benefits in Christ. See, it, this whole thing, it's grouped in the same lie that healing's not for today, right? The gifts of the Spirit aren't for today. It's all grouped in the same thing, right? It's, it's the same devil, same lies, right? In fact, listen to this. The word of God refers to deliverance from demon spirits as healing. Acts 10, 38, Jesus was healing. Say healing. healing. Healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Did Jesus cast any demons out? Yes, he did. He was the deliverance ministry. When you, the ministry of deliverance is really a part of the healing ministry. In fact, you cannot have a full, uh, complete, I should say, a complete healing ministry without casting demons out. And we're going to get into this in a moment. You can't do it. That's why you have healing ministries who don't want to touch the whole demon issue. And then you see people, you know, what they're not, they're not taking care of the root. They're trying to deal with the fruit, Right? And they're not getting to this thing because some things are directly caused by the presence of a demon spirit in a person. You don't get that demon out, there ain't no freedom coming. There's no healing coming. Are you following me? Go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Oh, yeah, the devil's done a wonderful job trying to keep this benefit away from Christians. But I'm trying to ruin that. Amen. Amen. Luke 9, 37 through 42. 37 through 42. All right. And it says, Now it happened on the next day when they had come down from the mountain that a great multitude met him. Suddenly a man from the, a man from the multitude cried out saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit, a demon, seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth. Children can have demons. Are you following me? Oh, touchy subject, I know. <laughs> and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I bear with you? Bring your son here. And as he was still coming, they were bringing the young boy to Jesus. The demon. Oh, my, my, my. We're, we're hitting some uh, pings in the spirit tonight. The demon threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit. Here it is, underline it. Healed the child and gave him back to his father. The, the, that child was not healed until the demon left. You cast demons out, it brings healing in. Amen. Deliverance ministry is healing. Amen. Are you following me? Yes. You cannot separate casting out demons from healing. And like I said, you will not have a complete healing ministry without the knowledge of deliverance and casting demons out. There is no place, listen to me, here we go, ready for this? There is no place in the Bible that suggests that a Christian cannot have a demon. Oh, Maybe I should just bring a chair up here and just kind of camp out a little bit. Because here's why. Because I know I'm saying these things and, and, and it's just kind of like, oh, wow. You know, you, maybe things you never heard before, right? So it's, it's, it takes a little bit to register. I get it. Let me say it one more time. There is no place in the Bible that suggests that a Christian cannot have a demon. 
See, here's the deal. Here we go. When you, get, when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came to live in your spirit, man. Am, is, right? Anybody in here tonight? Right? The Holy Spirit came into your spirit. Your body and your soul, your mind, will, and emotions did not get born again. <laughs> and those are the areas that can be occupied by demons. The physical body and the soul, your mind, will, and emotions. So you'll hear some Christians say, well, the Holy Spirit and demon spirit, they can't dwell in the same temple. They don't. They don't. The Holy Spirit's in your spirit. But demons can attack the physical body, and they can attack your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. You following me? Let me ask you this. You ready for this? This one always kind of brings it home. Can a Christian be in bondage to pornography? Can a Christian be in bondage to alcohol? Can a Christian be involved in fornication? Of course. Can a Christian have a disease in their body? Of course. Can a Christian be blind? Can a Christian be deaf and dumb? Yeah. Can a Christian have epilepsy? Yes, of course they can. Well, there are biblical examples for every one of those things that were caused by demonic spirits present. Wow. <laughs> wow. Everything I just asked you, you will find an example in the Word of God that a demonic spirit was present causing those things. You know what I find so interesting? That last thing I read about children having it, right? Why? Th think of how messed up we are in this country in this day and age, right? Back then in Bible days, people could recognize a demonic spirit present. People could recognize when a demon was manifesting through a child, through an individual. But not us. Right. Oh, no, must be ADD. Oh, no, not us. Eh, it's something else. Let's just write a prescription. Listen, you can't medicate demons. Amen. You cast them out. Amen. You following me? Now, let me just say this. There, you... you <laughs> You got to be careful. I just seen in the news, just as I'm having this service, like yesterday I seen it, a three-year-old got killed in a botched exorcism at a church. Yeah, there, there are some, some idiots. Let's just tell it like it is. There are some idiots who, who, who ruin it. Now, that's the kind of thing that makes deliverance ministry look bad. That's the kind of thing the devil wants to get out in the, in the news right. to make all of us look like idiots, too. You've got to be careful who you go to. Are you following me? Just because there's some idiots doesn't mean there's a the real thing. Here's what I want to say. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Amen? My goodness. So all of these things I asked you, yes, a Christian can have it. We know that, right? So you would say, have to say anyone that has blindness, a spirit of infirmity, epilepsy, and all these things, they can't be a, a Christian because the root cause was a demon in these things. See, it just doesn't make sense, does it? I'm here to tell you tonight that deliverance from demonic spirits is primarily, you'll see why I say that, is primarily a benefit for Christians. Now, are you ready for this? Here's another one. Man, I'm slaying some sacred cows tonight, and I'm loving it. And I'm doing it around the world right now on Facebook. Welcome. All right, here we go. Contrary to popular belief, demons do not leave a person automatically when they get born again. There is no evidence in the Word of God that even suggests that theory. Not, not one, one verse. They must be cast out of an individual. In fact, Jesus and his disciples spent much time casting demons out. It's part of the gospel. It's part of the good news. So the obvious question then, 
Who in the world did Jesus and the disciples cast demons out of? Are you following me? You with me? Here's the answer. Most of the time, believers, they were casting demons out of people who were in covenant with God. I know what what people say. You ready for this? Oh, but that was the Old Testament, right? You ever heard that? That was under the Old Covenant. No, no, no. Listen to this. They were in covenant. And Christians in the New Covenant, we are in covenant if you're a Christian, right? All right, so here's the deal. So there were some instances where a demon was cast out of an unbeliever. That's why I say it's primarily a benefit for the Christian. There were some instances where a demon was cast out of an unbeliever. Here's one of them. Paul cast a spirit of divination out of a psychic. A demon was given this woman psychic ability. Stay away from psychics. Stay away from the occult. Stay away from Ouija boards. Are you following me? Stay away from them. They will open you up to demon spirits quicker than you can, whatever. Amen? So here's what happened. Paul cast this spirit of divination out because this lady who, was this, who had a demon of divination was following, in Acts 19, was following Paul and his posse around, right? They're trying to evangelize. And you got this lady saying, these are the men, these men are, the, are of the most high God. Oh, demons can sound spiritual too. That's why you need discernment. But listen, here's what happened. So this lady kept following them around and, and sounding real good, real spiritual, right? And it said Paul let this go on for a few days. Notice Paul did not act right away. He waited to get insight from the Holy Spirit. If you're going to cast a demon out of an unbeliever, you better have the Holy Spirit telling you to do it. Are you, that's why I say it's primarily a benefit for Christians. But if you're going to cast it out of an unbeliever, see, Paul waited, and it said he, basically he felt in his spirit, okay, I got the discernment. I know what's going on now. I'm ready to deal with this. And he cast the demon out of her. Immediately, she lost her psychic ability when that demon came out. Here's another one, the demoniac. Remember the demoniac in the graveyard? He was totally insane, totally out of his, he was out of his mind. If someone, if there's someone, an unbeliever, that's totally out of their right mind, go for it. Are you following me? Go for it. Someone who cannot even think straight. Someone who, you know, they're in these insane asylums, whatever. This guy in the graveyard, he was naked and he was cutting himself, barking like a dog. By the way, cutters. That's demonic. You got someone who's cutting themselves, I guarantee you there's a demon present in that person. Guarantee you. So the demoniac was totally insane. Jesus set him free. But listen, so you you better, on someone that's out of their right mind, go for it. Let's get them in their right mind, right? But other than that with an unbeliever, don't touch it with a 10-foot pole unless the Holy Spirit tells you to do it. Some, for some reason, in the wisdom of God. Are you hearing me? Even an unbeliever at a healing service like this can be healed because of God's mercy and grace once in a while, right? It can happen. But here's the deal. So the purpose of casting out demons is not for the minister to put a, a feather in their cap. No, it's for bringing healing and wholeness to the individual that they're trying to minister to. It's all about the person you're ministering to. Now, let's slay some more sacred cows. You ready or are you ready to go home? Okay, good. Good, because I'm not releasing it yet anyways. But here we go. The King James Version uses the word possessed. But the more accurate word would be this. You ready for this? The more accurate word would be demonized. Or to be under the influence of a demon. Possessed, you see, I don't like the word possessed. And, and people hear the word possessed and they're like, oh, no, a Christian can't be possessed. Well, possessed seems to imply ownership. We're not talking about ownership. If you're a Christian, you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The devil cannot own a Christian. It's like this. You ready for this? It's like having mice in your house. The mice don't own the house, but you need to get rid of the mice. They're intruders. Demons are intruders. 
So I don't like to use the word possessed. I know what I mean when I say it. Most people don't, right? They think ownership. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a Christian in a certain area of their life can be under the influence of a demon, all right? That's what we're talking about here. Now, most uh, demons enter a person before they're saved. Uh, let's just face it. I mean, how many of us don't have junk in our trunk before we came to Christ? <laughs> BC, right? I mean, we, we pff, come on. There is so many. And, you know, uh, a lot of times, uh, even in the womb, people can get de demons. Wow, that sounds far out. Well, get ready. Put your spiritual safety belt on because the spirit realm is beyond your natural thought process. The spirit realm is so, so much deeper, it'll blow your natural mind. Amen? Now, in, in extreme backslidden conditions, a believer can open themselves up to the devil. It, that's what Ephesians 4.27 says, neither give place to the devil. Now, what's interesting, that Greek word about the Greek word translated place, are you ready for this, is the word to topos meaning a physical location. There's times when I'm praying for people who have arthritis. Man, I found out arthritis, that's a, that, that can be a spirit. And, they, and, and, it, and sometimes it's in certain areas, their hands are all, you know. And, and there's a spirit in that location. And, and man, you command it to go. Man, I've seen people's hand, fingers and straighten out come after you command a devil to go. I'm telling you, this, this, there, God has, all I can say is God has provided a way for everything that we're going through. But you got to be open to what, the, what this thing might be. But some Christians are too proud to say, no, no, it can't be a demon in my life. And I'm here to tell you, well, it probably is if you're thinking that. Are you following me? It don't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean you're not saved. You're saved. But, but somewhere down the line, this demon got a hold of you somewhere maybe through a traumatic experience, right? So whatever, whatever it is. Some traumatic experience opens someone up to this thing. And, and sometimes it's not necessarily what you did. Are you ready for this? this? I know, it seems unfair. It's sometimes what someone has done to you. Are you following me? Why, Pastor James? I, you, have to, I, you know, that's just the way it is but we know how to get rid of those suckers. And that's the key. Are you following me? Now, let me show you some evidence in the word here. Go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. <laughs> Are you fed up with, with these uh, demonic spirits uh, tormenting you in life? Come on, somebody. There's a way out. Acts 8, 4 through 8. I want to show you something. So I said this comment. Demons do not leave an individual once they got born again. They do not automatically leave. And I got proof right here. Acts chapter 8, 4 through 8. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Look at verse 7. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Going through deliverance will bring you great joy. <laughs> you, you don't know what freedom is until a devil leaves your life. Are you hearing me? If demons left a person automatically when they become a Christian, Philip wasted a lot of time casting out devils in Samaria. Why didn't he just get them saved and say, done? Are you following me? I, I'm going to throw this at you. I, I believe this, that these people that were getting delivered from demons, these were not unbelievers. These were people that made Jesus Christ Lord of their life and then felt now, now they qualified. They're in the covenant to receive deliverance. He casted them out of Christians. He cast it. it. Listen to me. If they Again, if they left automatically, why didn't he just get them saved? Then it's done, right? Why do you want to deal with the devil when you can just get someone saved and boop, they leave automatically? The fact is they don't leave automatically. Man. 
Mm. I mean, he could have just gotten them saved, water baptized, and man, they're clean, good to go. Nothing left. Mm. You know, here's the thing. You ready for this? What most people don't tell new Christians? That when you make Jesus Lord of your life, that's just the beginning. Guess what? Now there's a house cleaning that happens. <laughs> you just, you know, oh man, get ready. I mean, that's just the beginning. That's just the open door where you say, okay, Holy Ghost, come in, do some cleaning. That's it. <laughs> man. So listen to this. In fact, Jesus' first exorcism took place in a synagogue, in a church. Go with me to Mark chapter 1. Look at this. I, when you're talking about the uh, deliverance ministry and casting out demons, Mark is a wonderful resource. The book of Mark talks so much about casting out demons. Oh, yeah, it's great. All right, so Mark 1, 21 through 28. Look at this. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught a church. Let's just call it a church, right? And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. It's time for the body of Christ to have authority against this thing. I, you know, listen, it's going to take more than a five-point Reader's Digest sermon to get people set free. Are you hearing me? We need to walk in authority. And these, these, these people in dead religion notice, they're like, there's something different about this guy over here. He's talking like he has authority. Well, guess what? We have that same authority. Jesus gave it to us. Now, there was a man in their synagogue, in their church, with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, see, why can't we? Hey, why do demons feel so comfortable in our churches? This demon in this individual was so uncomfortable by the anointing. He screamed out. Can you imagine? It's like someone here hearing about this. Maybe there is someone in here, but where you're feeling a stirring on the inside. See, I've been in, in services and stuff where you're preaching, and all of a sudden someone's manifesting demons. They start screaming because they can't stand to hear that you're bringing light to this situation. They don't like to know that you have authority. So if you're in here right now or if you're watching online, and you're hearing this, and sometimes people start to feel, oh, just feel uneasy. You feel maybe, maybe like your stomach's starting to hurt. Sometimes that's a demon being stirred up in people. I'm just telling you like it is right now. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Listen to this. People, I've ministered to people who flew in from Florida in California for deliverance. I, I, what I'm saying is, this is how rare the deliverance ministry is. People are so desperate, they'll hop on a jet and fly across the country to get help. I mean, this is a sad situation. But notice here, so Jesus casted a demon, his first exorcism out of a guy in church. Look at Mark 1, 38 through 39 here. But he said to them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. Lee, here we go. And he was preaching in their synagogues. I'm going to say churches. Throughout all Galilee and... Why is this not happening in the body of Christ? Why is this not happening? It needs to happen, amen? Why are we letting people sit in the pew who are suicidal? Who are in bondage, right. pornography, addictions, you name it. Right. And they're going down the toilet bowl while we're sitting here doing our nice little sermon. 
No, we need, to, we need to get in the trenches, baby. We need to get there. We need to minister to these people, cast demons out, bring emotional healing to them, and say, go, now go. Get out and preach the gospel. You have received, now go help someone else. Amen. See, this is, I'm telling you right now, this is why the enemy wants to keep people in bondage. Because when you get set free, you're going to want to go help other people. Amen. That's what it's all about. Now, you need to understand this. I know someone's saying this right now. Well, it was in a synagogue, but what if it was an unbeliever in their synagogue, right, who, who manifested a devil? Okay, you need to understand this. Back in those days, only those who were in covenant with God would come to the synagogue. It's not like nowadays on a, on a Sunday morning service, you know, tomorrow here at Living Waters, you know, you got, you got the believers, and then you might have someone come who's not a believer with their relative. It's not like that. Back in those days, it was people who were in covenant with God. You following me? Go to Mark 7, 25. Mark 7, 25. How many in here, with a, just a show of hands, are you hearing something new tonight about this topic? Wow. Wow, yeah, praise God. All right, we're plowing. Get ready. Here at, at Living Waters Chapel, we're forming a healing and deliverance ministry team. A team. You're, I tell you right now, Carroll, Michigan, right here, you're going to be able to find deliverance. Amen? Right here. Living waters. Hallelujah. Mm, Holy Ghost, move. Amen? Mark 7. Mark 7, 25 through 29. Look at this. And it says, For a woman, for a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, Jesus, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him, Jesus, to cast the demon out of her daughter. Here we go. But Jesus said to her, let the children, oh, let the children first be filled. In other words, those who are in covenant with God. And I'm going to say Christians. For it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Deliverance ministry, freedom from demons, is the children's, Christian's bread. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Guess what? Jesus helped. You got to love Jesus, right? I mean, this guy, <laughs> I mean, what a heart of gold. Amen. My, my, my. But Jesus was trying. I believe Jesus did that to prove a point and to put it in his word to say, this benefit is for you, my children, the children's bread. Amen? I love that. Those who are in covenant with God. I'm almost done. Bear with me here. All the, other, uh, all the others that Jesus cast demons out of, they must have been in covenant with God. They had to have. How do I know that? Because if they weren't in covenant with God, he would have did the same thing he did to this woman, right? So everyone else that Jesus ministered to, what I'm trying to get at, they were, they were believers. They were in covenant with God. Say covenant. covenant. Let me show you another bit of evidence. Luke 13, go there with me. Luke 13. Well, now, when we're done with this teaching, that's when um, I'll, anybody who wants personal prayer can come up, and, and I'll just, whoever doesn't need it, you're free to go after that. Um, you don't have to hang around when we're praying for people. But um, sometimes it can get a little wild. Amen. No. <laughs> Man, I love deliverance ministry. You know what? Deliverance ministry is amazing because it brings the Bible to life. Man, when you see demons screaming at the name of Jesus, all it does, it makes your faith go from here to, <laughs> whoa, wow, <laughs> right? Now, sometimes the manifestations don't happen. Whatever happens, happens, right? But, all right, Luke 13, 10 through 17. It says, Now he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a, here it is, a spirit of infirmity, uh, 18 years, and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. So now we have a physical, a literal physical infirmity that is the direct cause of a demon of infirmity. 
a spirit of infirmity. It was a demon that literally caused this thing for 18 years in this woman. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, listen, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And when he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, the pastor, <laughs> answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. Can you believe Jesus would do that? I mean, what? And he said to the crowd, there are six days in which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, I love Jesus' response, hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? They care more about their animals than people. Those people that are in dead religion care more about animals than people. Come on, somebody. So ought not this woman, here it is, underline it, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And when he said these things, all of his ad adversaries were put to shame. And all the multitude rejoiced for the glorious things that were done. I want you to notice right there that she was a daughter of Abraham. She was in covenant with God. Just another piece of evidence. This, the deliverance ministry, being free from demons, is a benefit for the Christian. Amen? Amen. In Matthew 10, Jesus sent the 12 out, and then he sent the 70 to the lost sheep of Israel, to those who were in covenant with God. Now, it, now that word lost, that doesn't mean they were lost or unsaved. It means those that were scattered, who were in covenant with God, who were scattered in the area looking for the Messiah to come. Amen? So, um, the Word of God, I already read that scripture that we, we already seen that children can have demonic spirits, right? I mean, that's a real touchy subject, but I wonder how many of these things that children deal with today are demonic. I would say, I bet you that, I mean, it's huge. Look, look at this, this world system that we're living in. Look how the, the confusion it's putting on the kids. The homosexuality, the lesbianism, the transgender movement. They got them so confused they don't know what bathroom to use. Man, demons are loosed at a greater scale than ever before against our children. Amen? And we need to come against it. Anybody here heard of the, the guy Finus Dake? You ever heard of the Dake Bible? Study Bible? Okay. He was one of the greatest uh, preachers and Bible scholars of all times. He said this statement. He said, there are demon spirits for every sickness, unholy trait, and doctrinal error known among men. They must be cast out or restricted in order to uh, receive uh, relief from them. So we, we did see that unclean spirits, they call the human body their house, right? And they need to, so these demonic spirits, they, they're named by their function. Say function. function. All right? They're named. There's a, there's a spirit of fear. The Bible literally names a lot of these, but not all of them, but uh, spirit of fear, lust, pornography, spirit of witchcraft. Um, so they're named after their function. All right? So just know that when you're ministering to someone, you know, someone says, um, you know, I have a lust problem. Well, chances are it's probably a spirit of lust there, right? But here's the thing. Some, most of the time, it's not just one. There's a, another one, maybe a spirit of rejection, spirit of abandonment, something that happened emotionally to them that it's not just lust. There's something that kicked that thing off. Are you hearing me? Rejection is a big one. All right. Um, so, yeah, it, like I said, it's crazy how people recognize that there is a demonic issue in people. But many people don't think of that nowadays, right? All right. So, I'm, I'm just telling you, we need to go for the root cause of these things. Um, and, you know, in my 23 years of ministering deliverance, I have ministered to people in full time ministry, I've ministered to full time pastors. They're on the ground screaming, <laughs> okay? So what I'm trying to say is um, 
don't feel bad if you have a demon. <laughs> okay? All right? So, you know, many people think that, that full-time ministers are supermen. No, 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 no. They deal with the flesh just as much as everybody else. Are you hearing me? I mean, they've been in as much junk in their life in the past as, as everybody else. They have a calling of God on their life and anointing to minister. But there's still a personal, private side to every person, no matter what they're doing. Are you following me? Now here, let me finish up on this and I'm done. Some people say, what about Galatians chapter 5 where it talks about the works of the flesh? You can't cast flesh out. You ever hear that argument? I'm going to blow your mind here. They try to use that as evidence that a Christian cannot have a demon because it's just the flesh, right? Well, that is true. You cannot cast out flesh, but here's the deal. Demons operate through the fleshly nature of a person. Are you following me? So they use it as an excuse that, you see, it's just the flesh. It, it's not a demon. It's just their flesh. Yeah, but that's where a demon hides in those fleshly desires, those fleshly compulsions. Are you following me? You just told me earlier that a, demon, that, that a Christian can have addictions. You just told me earlier that a Christian can be into pornography. You just told me, hello, yeah. right? So why are they called? Now remember, there's a demon for every function, right? So why are they called the works of the flesh then? So here's what I want to tell you. Ready for this? The Holy Spirit showed this to me a while, a long time ago, and it blew my mind. Because I kind of struggled with that too. I'm like, well, it talks about the flesh, what about this? And the Lord said this to me. He said, I had to call it the work of the flesh and not the work of demons because a demon cannot control your free will. It's you doing it. You're giving in to the compulsion of the demons. Are you, did that just blow anybody else's mind in here? Did that just kind of give you a whole different perspective on the works of the flesh? Because it did me when I found out. Because everyone, when I first got saved and into the, the deliverance ministry, people would try to talk me out of it. Well, you're just dealing with flesh there. No, a Christian can't have a demon. And then the Holy Spirit, man, when that revelation comes, isn't it amazing? A devil cannot control your will. It's someone who gives in to the compulsions of a demon spirit. Now, now here's the deal. You, <laughs> here we go. So... Some people, have you noticed some people are more out of control with compulsions and addictions than others? You ever notice that? Here's the deal. There are some people who are so beat down emotionally that their will is so beat down. Whatever, whatever the compulsion is of that demon, they just, they're letting the demon have his way. Because emotionally, they're not healed. Emotionally, they're so beat down. Other than that, uh, it, it's, it takes your will to cooperate with a demonic spirit. Just, just like, thank you, Holy Ghost, just like he just said this. He goes, because it takes their will to flow with me. The Holy Spirit just told me that on the inside. It takes your free will to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Well, it takes your will to cooperate with an unholy spirit. Are you following me? So you can never say the devil made you do it. No. You cooperated with the devil. Come on, somebody. Wow. Man. Sometimes you just got to kind of sit and relax on that glory bomb once in a while, that revelation. You know what I'm saying? He told me that a long time ago, and I'm still kind of blown away by that. Well, anyways. I don't know. I'm... <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Gosh, you got to love the Holy Spirit. Amen? Here's my point, and I'm done, is that deliverance ministry is primarily for Christians. Yes, a, a, a Christian can have a demon and need deliverance. It takes a humility. It takes a humbling to set up an appointment to seek help for something like that. It really does right? That's why I said this. You better make sure you're picking the right minister who's doing it, someone that you can trust, 
someone you can confide in that you, it's not going to be blown all over every, uh, the city. Are you hearing me? I want to say this. It's available. And we are always here. I'm not, we're not the only ones. There's other ministers who do this. All right. So, but what I'm saying is uh, Marianne and I and the deliverance team here at Living Waters Chapel, we will always be available for you. All right. Let's stand up in this place. Thank you, Lord. Whew. Thank you, Lord. Wow. See, most of deliverance ministry, the hard part's not casting out demons. You know what the hard part is? Getting a person's thought life shifted. Get it, bringing healing to that person emotionally. Because it's in that stronghold, the thought life is where they're holding on to this thing. And, and there needs to be a shift in the thought life. So I'll tell you what, in a deliverance session, 90, 99% of a deliverance session is dealing with emotional healing. I'll tell you that right now. And when you come to a, 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 a session like that, you better come. You better come ready to bear it all as far as your emotions. I mean, I want you to come because we're, we got to bring you to the point of that pain, that point of that pain that, that circumstance that has gotten you in that spiritual rut. You know what I'm talking about? We want you to go to that point of the pain so we can bring healing to it. Many people, they don't want to go there, and then the devil's not going anywhere without a change in the thought life. I'll tell you that right now. Right. That's why the Bible says renew your mind. Renew your mind. Amen? Father, thank you for this word. Father, I thank you for this night. Lord, I pray for every person in this place. Lord, I just loose your healing anointing upon them, Lord. Lord, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Lord God, reach to the deepest part of their heart, Lord God. Whatever it is. And Lord, I pray as we, as we bring people up, those individuals that need prayer tonight, Holy Spirit, move. I pray that miracles, signs, and wonders would be loosed in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray you would encamp every person who's come here tonight. Encamp them with your holy angels. I plead the blood of Jesus over them. And I pray this word that was taught, Lord God, would, would just sit in their heart and that you would expand it, that you would reveal to them things that I didn't say. Holy Spirit, give them revelation. Show them how to apply it to their own life personally. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. All right. Well, let's have the board members come up here too. And, uh, and so if you need prayer tonight for anything, physical healing, emotional healing, anything, just come up and line up at this altar. The rest of you, if you don't need prayer, hey, thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, I hope you learned something and uh, had a good time. We're going to be doing these more often, so keep an eye out. Hey, and go to church tomorrow. Go to church tomorrow. Amen? All right, everyone. Oh, I feel the anointing up here. Strong. Uh, Silas, let's play some music while we're uh, praying for people up here. Wow. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you again soon. Thank you, Lord.